Thank you very much for joining me uh, today, Raluca. I want to uh, start in the world of academia. Like me, you're an MIT alum and have since moved to UC Berkeley and started Rice and Skylab. So I'm sure the audience want to hear about what is Rice and what is Skylab that you're working on. Thank you, Young. Thank you for having me here. Um, so the way it works at Berkeley, we have this special lab model called the Patterson Lab Model, mm -hmm. where a few faculty come together to tackle what we think are the most urgent and impactful problems at the moment in computing systems. So in the RISE Lab, which we started six years ago, the cloud computing was a major system that was used, but the problems were how do you have intelligent and secure systems in the cloud? So we came together to solve that. Now, five or six years later, the next challenge we're seeing is the sky lab, namely the sky above the clouds. So how do we construct applications that run across different clouds seamlessly, easily, securely? Mm -hmm. So uh, if I'm a uh, enterprise, and using many of uh, apps today, we all depend on the cloud. And much of our application is usually confined into particular cloud environment, whether it's Amazon, Azure, or Google. But the portability of cloud has been a challenge. Yes. And um, sounds like the mission of Sky Lab is trying to address that issue. Indeed. So if you think about that organization, what they have to do today is a headache, right? Mm -hmm. They have to set up all these systems on different clouds. They have to worry about compliance and policy as to what data can migrate from one place to another. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have to program in different programming models. Then they have the security of all this data in mind, but they have different security models, so it's a headache. So for us in the Skylab, we're looking to develop the next generation platform that makes this very easy to use for an enterprise. So they can harness the different cloud power, the different security, but with very, very easy programming and mm. without requiring expertise. So it's a lot like a, uh, in old days, we used to have the server architecture and we have to use particular server for particular applications and dedicate to the particular hardware and software. And, uh, and then virtual VMware came, container came, which I think a lot of the technology also pioneered in Berkeley to yes, enable so well. this open platform capacity. Now it sounds like you're moving that up to one more level up. Absolutely, we are. And one artifact of that is that it's going to encourage innovation. Because today you have big cloud providers like Microsoft or Amazon, AWS, where you have all possible services. But if you are a smaller cloud, it's really hard to break into this market if you only offer one specialized service. Mm -hmm. But with this kind of sky computing, you can have the small clouds provide what they're best at mm -hmm. and then use the other clouds for the rest of what you need. Right. It sounds like much more democratization yes, of compute. Absolutely that's available. Also, geographically, given the global tension that we are living in, European wants their own data to stay, Korea wants to have their data stay, Japanese want to do the same, and US as well. So how do you make sure your data is protected and secure within the geography, right? I think that's another big challenge. Yes, that's a very big challenge. So regulations, privacy regulations, policy are huge challenges for enterprises today to deploy their systems, their applications. And that's another thing we want to tackle in the Skylab mm -hmm. because we want to make it very, very easy to deploy a system without having to think of all these difficulties and headache, where data should be, what are the policies, the regulations. We want to make those automatically compliant. Mm -hmm. Great, Olga. Let's just talk about. I mean, we met because of your startup company, yes. OPAC, that uh, we led the um, Series A investment. I think it'll be great if you can talk about your startup that you're working on and what problem you're trying to solve. Absolutely, yeah. So we're very lucky to, you know, have you guys as investors. Um, so the story of OPAC is that it started from research at UC Berkeley in the Rise Lab. And the idea is that we noticed a lot of companies struggle with confidential data that's locked into silos and very difficult to access. So the question that they brought to us a lot was how can I collaborate across different parts of my organizations? How can I analyze? How can I learn from confidential data when it's locked in? Mm -hmm. So at UC Berkeley, we, with my students and colleagues, we worked on an open source called MC Squared. 
stands for multi-party confidential computing, mm -hmm. which is basically putting together our research on how to compute on data while keeping it protected. Mm -hmm. So it sounds counterintuitive, but it's very powerful. So you compute and process on data that remains encrypted and protected at all times. Mm -hmm. And so now we had this open source that we were developing and getting adoption from various companies, publishing top tier conferences, papers. And so, and then we were starting to get requests such as, oh, I need 24 seven support. Mm -hmm. uh, I need graphical user interface, things that you don't do in research and it doesn't reward you. Mm -hmm. So here is where opaque story begins because supernaturally and organically, a number of students came to us, the faculty, mm -hmm. let's start a company. You know, yeah. this, there's clear need for this. Uh, and so let, let's start it. And so we began opaque a year and a half ago. Great. So we start from kind of open yes. platform to address the multi-party data exchange Absolutely. without sacrificing security and privacy of data, multi-geography within the department, solving the issues, how do you do that? And then that became the genesis of your company to address these big problems. We think this is a world and catalyst believe this is a big problem. We think that as we're going forward, we are in a data economy and we rely on much of the data that are out there. How do you put it all together? How do you add, how to join, but without compromising the security and privacy of information is critical. Absolutely. And, but there are many multiple methods that are out there, right? Yes. So, uh, you know, there is a uh, 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 different things that we've been looking at uh, in terms of the differential approach to, uh, I don't know, homomorphic, homomorphic um, encryption. encryption. And so you may want to give it a little bit. I know it doesn't have to be too technical given your no, background, I'll, but I'll it would yeah, be great <laughs> if you can give some perspective of how is it different than others. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So um, I actually started my PhD at MIT working on homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party computation, this kind of technologies that leverage pure cryptography mm -hmm. where just to give a very high level explanation, what happens is that you have the cryptography manipulate encrypted data with some algorithms without decrypting it. Mm -hmm. And But the problem is that those algorithms are actually very, very slow. So you can run basic operations like averaging or some, but you can't run machine learning or analytics. Mm -hmm. And so that's why homomorphic encryption is not something that you can use for rich analytics or machine learning. Instead, with Opaque, so years later, we have Intel develop this amazing technology called hardware enclaves, and now a bunch of hardware uh, providers are also offering it. And that gives you like hard hardware enforcement mm -hmm. of protection of data when it gets computed, and as soon as it gets out, it's encrypted. Mm -hmm. So even if an attacker breaks in, they only see encrypted data. Mm -hmm. So this approach, hardware enclaves, when combined with cryptography, is what we showed in our research, can be very efficient, can provide a very strong level of security. Mm -hmm. And here's the important part, can be frictionless. Mm -hmm. So opaque is making confidential computing frictionless. And that's very, very important because you don't want to have to need expertise to right. use a technology. Right. You don't want to have to wait, I know, 10 times to 100 times more for a request from mm -hmm. the user side. Mm -hmm. So the frictionless is very, very important. I think, I think that's a really good point. There are a lot of interesting ideas. Like uh, the, the question is really overhead. Yes. The question is really how easy to use. Yeah. And it's a question of the compute time it requires. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that uh, this idea of also hardware enhanced uh, encrypt is a really interesting way because it gives you that additional protection that are hard to, uh, I guess, unhack. Absolutely. I see it as, in some sense, taking some of the best of the cryptography only solutions and pure hardware. It's really both mm -hmm. because this hardware protects data and computes on it, but as soon as it goes out of the hardware, it encrypted it before. And there's also something called authentication, which, which makes sure the data is doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Also, the computation stays unchanged. So it's kind of a combination of the two techniques. That's mm -hmm. very, very powerful. So this is the uh, whole new world we're living in, yes. right? We are yes. in a data world where so much of um, uh, companies, the organizations, countries, and geography want to all protect their information. And they were also regulated by GDPR and other uh, compliance. And that probably is the trend that we think is very important going forward for your company. 
Absolutely. As you say, regulations are only becoming more and more stringent mm -hmm. and they're disrupting businesses today through GDPR, through you know, cookies going away, through lots of privacy regulations, through policies about keeping data in one place and not allowing it to flow in other places. And so the world is heading into a situation where you have to have systems think of privacy, provide confidentiality and, and security. That's great. Now, I want to just kind of go back to your background. Okay. Uh, background, <laughs> you were uh, born in Romania, I believe. Yes, in Transylvania, Dracula's Transylvania. castle. Oh, Transylvania, isn't that known for like Dracula? Yes, actually, <laughs> I was born quite close to Dracula's castle. Really? Well, actually, my first <laughs> fencing coach was from Transylvania. Oh, I see. So actually, yeah, I was very fond of him. Uh, but anyhow, uh, great, Transylvania. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then you uh, came to US yes. in early age at um, Caltech MIT. Yes. And got your uh, PhD at MIT. Yes. And then uh, you went, uh, your postdoc at ETH in yes, Zurich. Zurich, yes. Uh, the University of Einstein, I believe. <laughs> and then you came to Berkeley. Yes, as a professor. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so tell us a little bit about your academic journey and why you did, did you choose academic background rather than industrial background? Yeah, very, very, very good question. Uh, so I started in my undergrad wanting to do research very early on, and I was fascinated with computer security mm -hmm. because it has both the depth of theory like cryptography, but it also you build systems. Mm -hmm. So I liked, I needed both. I, I couldn't just build without something that was deep, but I couldn't just do deep things without applications. So mm -hmm. I always really loved both. So then at MIT, I started doing research with Ron Rivest, which, who is the R in our essay, mm -hmm. um, and Barbara Liskov, who mm -hmm. won the Turing Award for Byzantine Fault Tolerance. And so I had amazing, absolutely amazing mentors to learn from, which inspired me to stay in security. So after MIT undergrad, I stayed for master's and PhD at MIT. Mm -hmm. um, and then I really, really wanted to become professor. So why, you ask me? Uh, for two reasons. One, I loved being on the cutting edge mm -hmm. of technology and research and innovating. But also I saw that professors also have an entrepreneurial band. Mm -hmm. And Berkeley is really, in some sense, perfect mm -hmm. place for me. Mm -hmm. One, because of the lab model I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and second, well, they say, you know, MIT is too far from Silicon Valley and Stanford is too close. <laughs> 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 so Berkeley is just right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, and combining entrepreneurship and right. um, working with my students on research and mentoring is really, uh, you know, the most enjoyable for me. I have to say I'm a big fan of Berkeley because my father went there as well. And But what I really like as a technologist is that it's the culture and its DNA of supporting open platform. Yes. I think so much great innovation came out of Berkeley that are really impacting all of our lives, right? Absolutely. I mean, so you, that you can just go on from Linux all the way to you know, Apache Arrows to uh, now the you know companies like Snowflakes and Databricks are all built on the top. Now your company is on the top of that, trying to solve the uh, open community, giving it access that could not be done before and uh, in a way that are much more democrat yes. democratic and be being able to continue to pioneer in this area. I completely agree. Open source is really deep in our DNA. And we like it because, you know, we open to the world what we're doing. It provides thought leadership. It provides the world can become your teammate. Mm -hmm. They can contribute. They can play with it. They can try it out. We can develop it together, get feedback together. So we really, really love open source. And actually, my colleague at Berkeley on Stoica, big mm -hmm. pioneer in open source and, right. and Spark and also uh, Databricks co-founder, he used to tell tell us early on, he used to say, look, you can have a really impactful research project, but it will just probably stay on the shelf unless you go and do it for real. Mm -hmm. Do it for real in open source, do it for real in a company, in a company product. That's when people will use it. And for me, you know, hearing that early on mm -hmm. was very, very inspiring. That is very good mentorship for yes. you as well, isn't it? Now, you are not first time entrepreneur, it turned out, right? You also start the company uh, when you're MIT. Yes. Prevail, I Prevail, believe. So yes. tell us a little bit about that experience. Absolutely, yes. So I started Prevail at the end of my PhD at MIT based on my MIT PhD thesis. And what Prevail does is basically does end-to-end -end encryption for uh, file systems, for email, basically for common collaboration tools. 
And the whole idea is that there shouldn't be any central point of attack. Mm -hmm. So you, can, you can't hack the administrator, you can't hack anyone to get access to, any one party to get access to the data. Mm -hmm. So we're quite happy that Preval is going very, very well. Uh, it's focused on enterprise customers and was voted the um, number one email encryption for mm -hmm. enterprise for, by PC Magazine. So if you are like very concerned about security of your email communications with your contractors, employees, th this could be one approach you can protect yourself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And currently, a lot of customers are in the defense uh, market, which is very, very highly sensitive data. Right. And so they entrust us with the data. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that Preval can store and take care of your data and communicate. But then the next level was, how do you compute on it? Right. And that's where Opaque uh -huh. came in. Right, exactly. Because you can store, but you cannot really put your ML apps on the top of it to get a better analytics Absolutely. and stuff like that. OK. That and, and, and the important thing is that we have security not just in one piece. We have to have security all throughout. Right. Because if we just have security for you know, the computation and we don't have it for communication and storage, the mm. attacker is going to attack there. You can compromise. Exactly. If you have it for email and storage, not for computation, the attacker is going to go there. Right. So it's important to have security all throughout yeah. to have security. It's the, uh, they're also looking for the weak point. Exactly. And uh, to be a truly good secure system, it's a system thinking, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You're only as secure as your weakest link. Exactly. So let's go back a little bit to, uh, I want to talk about the technology and particularly the deep tech and the uh, role that you're playing as a uh, female um, entrepreneur, professor, and leader of running a company. Uh, I think you made a comment when you were in Romania, there were a lot more girls in engineering programs yes, than were. US. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Absolutely. So in my high school, uh, I was in a class, elite class for computer science and mathematics. The way they choose us is entirely based on score. So mm -hmm. they give us exams and how we score plus a little bit prior grades, but it's primarily scores. And so that class was extremely focused on computer science. We used to do eight, le have eight lectures of programming a week mm -hmm. and lots of math, including on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. And there were more women than men. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, growing up, my mom's software engineer, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of my f the females in my family, software engineers, doctors and whatnot, I just never really had the feeling that there would be less women in engineering and mm. computer science uh, until I came to the US and I was surprised that this was the case mm. and was surprised to even hear terms like gender ratio and mm. that we didn't need to have right. them before in Romania. So uh, this to me showed it's a, it's a cultural issue, really. How do we change or do you have any advice on this? Yeah, I would say that uh, the, culturally there have mm. to be some changes about, you know, how this is perceived. That this, you know, this job of engineering, computer engineering, computer, you know, software programming, mm -hmm. it's for everyone. Right. And I think early on, in our students, mm -hmm. we should, you know, from primary school and high school, they should know that this is the case. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't hear things like, oh, computer science is not for women or, you know, mm -hmm. they, they should hear encouragement. They should hear, see how exciting it is. Mm -hmm. And there should be always an equal treatment mm -hmm. of this topic and the interest and appeal to both the genders. I'm a big believer that success brings success. And people like you who is successful in building a uh, role model will attract a lot more female students, I'm sure, in the program. Hopefully. I mean, I'm enjoying that at UC Berkeley. A lot of my students are female and mm. male. We have a great balanced group, mm. and that's really a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, we actually found another company based on the uh, Berkeley program, Risk Five, which yes. is another... Uh, yes. I'm a microprocessor uh, engineer, so my training. So I love to see the new open risk platform that came out that can be able to uh, bring down the friction yes. for um, anybody to use and anybody can own and anybody can contribute that are also very uh, dynamic uh, program or architecture. So I, I'm really excited about this. And uh, Liputan, my partner and I found a company called Rebus that are enabling this new generation that hopefully we can make some impact on the open platform app. Absolutely. It's, it's very exciting. And having open source, not just in software, but is in hardware, as you say, is very valuable. For example, in our security research, 
we like to be able to prototype different security hardware. Mm -hmm. Because it's open source, we can do that. Right. It's important for us to have the world try to attack it. Yeah. The world try to analyze it to really have confidence in mm -hmm. something. So it, it's very, very valuable. Excellent. I want to have a one last question because your background in crypto as well. So clearly crypto market has been getting a lot of attention. Absolutely. It's an asset class now. It's classified as a, uh, something that people invest. I think at one point it was a three trillion dollar worth of the crypto market was yes. established. Although I think today in, the, in much less so because the market has been uh, changing. What is your view of Web3? Very good question. <laughs> Obviously, you know, with any such new term, there's some buzz and some superficiality, but there's also depth. Mm -hmm. Generally, what I like about it is the idea of decentralization, moving the world to decentralized trust and decentralized infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, before it was everything so centralized, which is what's a central point of attack and which is what is very, very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So I really like that aspect of it. And I like that, you know, the blockchain world and the crypto world has brought these kind of notions of decentralized trust. Mm -hmm. And by the way, thanks to them in cryptography and security, there's been explosion of techniques, True. explosion of creativity, mm -hmm. explosion of results and progress. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you then one more question as you're talking yes. about advancement. So we recently invest in a company that does the uh, zero proof knowledge. Yes. And uh, that seems to be very critical. But I want to get your perspective uh, because the idea is that um, to enable blockchain is still too much of the overhead, yes. too heavy, takes too long. So uh, there are better ways to do it. And obviously this the protocol, GPK, has been coming out. And I would just like to hear your perspective whether this is another, um, another approach or this is the way it's going to go. And just perspective on this, please. Yeah, I think zero knowledge is absolutely a fascinating topic and extremely powerful notion. So I mentioned how in my work on secure computation, you can compute with encrypted data that you don't see. But with zero knowledge, it's equally fascinating is the idea that you can do a long computation and then give a short proof to somebody. Mm -hmm. They can check it in a matter of milliseconds, even if you compute the whole year. Mm -hmm. And they can really be sure that you computed the right thing. Mm -hmm. So that's really the key point to scaling blockchains, right? Because blockchains get super long. Right. To verify them takes a long time. Right. The right. state involved is huge. But now you can have somebody do that work mm -hmm. and then prove with zero knowledge proofs to somebody else, whoever wants to check, very short proof, very fast to check that things are correct. And there's no way for the prover to cheat. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very powerful. And I think that's key to the scalability of blockchain. So I think they're here to stay, not just here to stay. They're here to find extremely amazing applications beyond even what we envision today. That's great. Uh, we're betting on that could be one of the major new way of computing. And you know the way I would uh, usually analogy that I use for zero proof knowledge is like having a map of uh, where is Waldo. Yes. And, <laughs> and to prove there is a Waldo, you can show there is a Waldo, but without showing all the details of yes, the map, right? Exactly. That's exactly kind of what we are discussing here. Exactly, but exactly. yet, the mathematically, you can prove that particular Waldo is there, and you have yes. to trust me, right? That's yes. the whole concept behind this zero exactly. proof knowledge. Exactly, and. Yeah. You know, you don't have to show where Waldo is because what you're going to do is you're going to take your big map, hide it with a cardboard, yeah. make a hole only where Waldo is, but then first rotate the map underneath mm. so people don't know how the map looks like under the carton, but they right. can see Waldo through the carton. It's there. So th it's there. Yeah. So you proved you know where Waldo is. I'm yeah. convinced because mm -hmm. you're showing to me, but I don't know where he is on the map still. Right. Right. And we do the same thing with cryptography and zero knowledge. Mm. The same kind of mixing and matching and shuffling happens with randomness in, mm. crypt in cryptography. Great. Well, thanks a lot. really appreciate your time, Rudeka. I know uh, you are very busy, but <laughs> Appreciate. I'm sure the our audience will appreciate your comments and your leadership and your mentor. Thanks for having me. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>